Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. I want to make a video about finding success in the markets. And one of the ways we can do that is by learning from people that came before us, people that were successful before us. You know, things don't really change. There's nothing new under the sun. I've said this before. And we can take the success of others because it leaves clues. We don't have to reinvent the wheel ourselves. As Charlie Munger says, you can't reinvent the wheel because no one's that smart. So it behooves us to learn from folks that have came be before us. One of those people is a guy named Bob Farrell, and he was a technician at Merrill Lynch for many years, an analyst. And he was also one of the elves on Wall Street, if you will. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser used to come on Friday nights. I remember watching it. And they would have this rotating group of guests. And they were known as the elves. They would uh, make predictions on the stock market. And they had like a little indicator if the elves majority thought the market was going to go up or down. It was something like that. And Bob Farrell was involved in that rotation. That's how I became aware of him. And occasionally you will see his rules for investing. There's 10 of them circulated in an article, usually around market tops or not necessarily market tops, but right around times when the market's getting frothy. I've seen it pop up every so often, but I saw it pop up recently. So I decided to go over it because they are pretty, they're, they're, they're really good rules. They make sense and they are, they repeat over time. And that's what I mean by success leaving clues and not reinventing things and being aware of history. Why? Because, you know, these markets really are guided by not necessarily economics or other th or things like that. Or the, in the long run, yes, you know, the prospects of a business's ability to generate cash and profits, you know, over 10 or 20 years will probably determine where it goes. But in the short term and medium term, a lot of things are pretty much driven by emotion you know, fear of missing out, greed, fear, these emotions, and understanding this and being able to take advantage of it can help us to gain an advantage. So he created a set of rules for investing, kind of a 10 commandments of investing, which we can learn from today. I'm going to go over a few of them and uh, give some thoughts. So the first rule is markets return to the mean over time. By quote, return to the mean, Feral means that when stocks go too far in one direction, they usually come back. If that sounds elementary, then remember that both eupho euphoric and pessimistic markets can cloud peaks. So that's what happens, right? I mean, just recently in the last few years, I can give some examples, right? Bitcoin, that's when I started this channel. If you go all the way back to the start of this channel, I think one of the videos that you will see that I started out with was a video about Bitcoin and the euphoria and how it was overvalued. And that was at 19,000. Uh, I basically called the top on that. And the same thing happened in cannabis stocks recently, right? I mean, I, I don't know the long-term business prospects of cannabis. Uh, seems to be an opportunity there, but there was euphoria. It was, you know, a lot of money went in there and a lot of people justify uh, we're justifying, you know, those prices. And what happened was it went up and then it came back down to, you know, an undershot. That's what usually happens. And we've seen the same thing happen repetitively uh, in the gold market, commodities, stocks, the market as a whole. And if you understand that, you can separate yourself from the emotion if you can. And that can provide clues to you that if a market's overbought, you should sell or if it's uh, undervalued that you can buy. Excesses in one direction will lead to an opposite excess in the other direction. Think of the market as a constant dieter who struggles to stay within the desired weight range but can't always hit the mark. You know, that's what happens with a lot of these people that uh, crash diet, right? The, the, they starve themselves and they lose a lot of weight and they're all happy. And then inevitably they put the weight back on. And in many cases, they put even more weight on, right? And then they become depressed. So the market is kind of like that. It kind of feeds off that first rule we were talking about, that things return to the mean, but not excesses don't necessarily just return to the mean. They usually undershoot then and create an opposite excess in the other direction. And uh, that has, happens time and time again. 
Uh, there's a quote here from Sam Stovall, who was a, another one of the guests that used to be on Wall Street Week. In the 1990s, when we were advancing by 20% a year, we were heading for disappointment. Sooner or later, you pay it back. So that's true. This is one of my favorite ones. This is something that I harp on. And this is when I can tell when something is near a top, when I hear it's different this time. And Farrell says that there are no new eras. Excesses are never permanent. And we've seen it time after time. I mean, some of you guys that are a little bit older, you probably remember the um, tech bubble in the late 90s, early 2000s, and the euphoria and the justifications for the excessive valuations. We just talked about Bitcoin when it ran to 19,000, then crashed. It's now returning, but it, you know, it's many years later. And the same thing, uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing now with some of the, you know, with the market being with some of these stocks. Uh, I'm using Zoom, as a matter of fact, right now to make this video. And that's one of the stocks that, you know, is overvalued in my view, but people will justify it, right? Because COVID and no one's going to go back to the office. So, you know, everybody's going to work from their laptop and meet virtually. So, that's why it justifies the excess evaluation. Very well could be true, but in the end, typically when these things get overvalued and people justify them, it's, there's, it's not a new era, it's nothing new, and excessive prices lead to uh, corrections. You know, this harkens to the first two rules. Many investors try to find the latest hot sector, and soon a fever builds that this time it's different. Of course, it never really is. When that sector cools, individual shareholders are usually among the last to know and are forced to sell at lower prices because they've justified it in their mind and they will seek out information that justifies the higher prices. That's why I preach about constantly you know, writing down why you entered a investment or speculation and then constantly challenging your thinking. If you're not doing that, then you're just gambling. Exponential, rapidly rising or falling markets usually go further than you think, but they do not correct by going sideways. This is Farrell's way of saying that a popular sector can stay hot for a long while, but will fall hard when a correction comes. Chinese stocks not long ago were market darlings posting parabolic gains, but investors who came late to this party have been sorry. We've just seen this over and over again. I mean, it kind of ties in. If you're seeing a common theme here, it's about emotions. It's about letting emotion drive your thinking. And you can't do that when you're dealing with these markets. We have to buy undervaluation and we have to sell overvaluation. And it's not hard, you know, if something's selling at, you know, 100 times uh, earnings, you know, you're buying a piece of a business. These aren't, you know, we're not flipping baseball cards or pennies. Um, we are buying pieces of businesses and we expect that the business will generate profits and cash that are accretive to us as shareholders via dividends or share buybacks over time. And uh, we can calculate, you know, cash flows and we can calculate, you know, valuations and we can look at historical uh, me uh, methods and historical um, timeframes and see if something is, is historically overvalued. We start looking to justify overvaluation, uh, then that gets us in trouble. And when something's going parabolic and you own it, it feels really good. You're going to get dopamine releases in your brain. Your pleasure centers are going to be hitting, and you're going to be hard pressed to say, "Hey, I'm not getting off this ride." And uh, you know, but nothing goes straight up, just like nothing goes straight down. Here's another one. The public buys the most at the top and the least at the bottom. Sure, and if they didn't, contrarian-minded investors would have nothing to crow about. Accordingly, many market technicians use sediment indicators to gauge investor pessimism or optimism. Then they recommend that investors head in the opposite direction. That's exactly right. That's why it's hard to buy things that are undervalued because the news is bad. It's pessimistic. And you're like, you know, who wants to live in that, right? You're like, you know, and especially, you know, like I described, I talked about on a previous video, you know, when you're buying things that are undervalued or out of favor, no one wants it. There's no good news. Uh, the news is bad. Uh, the rest of the market may be ripping away from you and you're 
situation that you've bought that you think is undervalued may be sitting there and probably will be sitting there a lot longer than you think, i.e. uranium. But if your fundamental analysis is correct and you have conviction because you have studied the subject and you believe that the information you have is correct, then you just have to wait. And uh, that's hard for most people to do. They'd rather just buy something that's making new highs and, you know, go along for the ride. But, you know, what inevitably happens, like we discussed before in some of the other rules, is that they buy at the top, they buy over valuation, and then when the thing rolls over and drops, they're justifying why it's going to come back or they're justifying why it's different this time. You know, after the dot-com bubble burst, a lot of the companies that were darlings then, like Microsoft and Cisco and things like that, they weren't bad businesses. The, company continu the companies continued to grow their revenues and profits, but the stocks didn't go anywhere for sometimes for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But they were good businesses. It depends what you pay. That is the key to success in these markets. If you overpay, you have to wait for the business to grow into the valuation. That's why we're seeking to buy things that are cheap and undervalued and that have a catalyst for a perception change by the market that will lead to uh, a re-rating and a revaluation of an undervalued situation. That's what we're trying to do. That's a lot easier, believe me. than If you don't think sitting for a year or two to wait for an undervalued situation to become, you know, for a catalyst to, to crystallize and start creating a re-rating for the, for the sector or company that you hold, imagine sitting there for 10 or 15 years waiting for Microsoft to grow into its valuation. Well, I guarantee you, I guarantee you most people will not do that. They'll sell at, you know, at a, at a bottom, you know, stock prices change, but you know, is the business growing? Is it generating cash flow? What are you paying for that cash flow? That matters. Fear and greed are stronger than long-term resolve. I mean, if you, you're starting to notice a pattern, a lot of this stuff kind of ties together. It kind of inter, interlaces, okay? We're talking about a lot about emotion and psychology with a lot of these rules. You know, investors can be their own worst enemy, particularly when emotions take hold. Stock market gains make us exuberant. They enhance well-being and promote optimism, says, says Meyer Statman, a finance pro professor at Santa Clara University who studies investor behavior. Losses, conversely, bring sadness, disgust, fear, regret. Fear increases the sense of risk, and some react by shunning stocks. You know, that's what we've been talking about. You know, if, if your stock that you bought goes down, you know, you're not going to feel happy about it. And if it's already undervalued, and you believe that your, your conviction is good or solid based on your research, then as Buffett says, you should be welcoming that decrease in prices. But I guarantee you 99% point nine percent of the investors don't do that and you should buy more but i guarantee you most people don't do that i do that it's taken me a long time to get to that point where i can control my emotions if i believe that my research is correct and my thesis is correct and something i like that a dollar goes to 50 cents then i have to like it more i mean i have to take a look at what what changed but a lot of times it's just you know there's no liquidity or or um there's no interest. It just drifts lower. But the fundamentals haven't really changed. You have to be a buyer. And that is very difficult to do. But that's really how real wealth is created. Markets are strongest when they are broad and weakest when they are narrow, when they narrow to a handful of, of blue chip names. When momentum channels into a smaller number of stocks, it means that many worthy companies are being overlooked and investors essentially are crowding onto one side of the boat. That's what happened with the nifty 50 stocks of the early 1970s, when much of the U.S. market's gains came from the 50 biggest companies on the New York Stock Exchange. As their price-to-earnings ratios climbed to unsustainable levels, these, quote, one-decision stocks eventually sunk. You know, it really benefits you and will profit you to study different market cycles, to study panics, to study downturns, to study, study euphoric uh, bull markets, because you will get a sense of the psychology. You will get a sense of the justifications uh, that were used to, to justify these high prices and for people to say to, in their minds 
hey, I don't care. This is a one decision stock. One decision means I just buy it and I never have to sell it. Well, that's not what happened. The things got so overvalued that eventually uh, it mean reverted, just like we talked about earlier. So, and these things just happen, these cycles happen over and over and over with different players, different participants, but human nature, like I said, does not change. So that's it for this video. Um, I just wanted to talk about this. Like I said, I've seen this article pop up a few times and I think it's uh, good to remind yourself of these rules. Um, I'll put a link to the article that I use. It's from like 2008, I think. But anyways, it does come up occasionally. You can do searches for it. Bob Farrell, uh, 10 rules for investing. Uh, but I think it would be profitable for people to take an interest in, especially if you're, if you're investing money in the markets, to understand psychology, understand the psychology of crowds, understand, you know, how we use, for example, magazine covers. I mean, uh, as contrarian uh, indicators, there's all these things that just repeat over time. It's, it's just amazing if you've old enough and you see this. And if you don't, you know, if you want to stick with this for 30 or 40 years, you'll get wiser, but why not try to use the wisdom if you're in your early 20s or early 30s, use the wisdom that has been gained before you and cut out a lot of the mistakes and save yourself a bunch of time because time and allowing compounding is what creates wealth. And you don't want to short circuit that by making mistakes that have already been made by many people before you. That's the goal of me going over these type of um scenarios and going over this educational process you know like i said before at the start of this video success leaves clues it's just like bread comes crumbs you just you just need to follow them but that takes a little bit of effort on your part and then working on your own psychology controlling the the fear and controlling the greed when things become good all right guys that's it for this video uh appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you next time